Okay, again, uh, my name is John Cheney, Vice President of English 3, and uh, welcome to the um, International Student Success Webinar today. The, the, the main uh, purpose of today's webinar will be to present the results of a survey that we conducted uh, over the last couple months. Uh, most of, of, who are, of you that are on here uh, or that are listening to this um, participated in this survey and we're very grateful for all of your uh, participation and, and great uh, great and thoughtful responses. We'll be going over some of those things today and, and really some interesting pieces in here that, that confirmed a lot of uh, suspicions we had as well as uh, it gave us some additional insight into this uh, into this important area of, of international education and, and, and more specifically international student success. Um, let's see here. I need to click this button right here. There we go. Okay, so there's there's a picture of me for those of you. I think I think I know a lot of the people that that are on here, but for those of you that don't know me, there's a a picture of me. You can find that on LinkedIn as well. Um, here's my direct email address. Uh, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to write me an email uh, at at any time. Uh, should you need anything today, if you want to engage with the webinar to see what other people are saying, uh, you can use the hashtag ISS webinar for International Student Services webinar and at English3, and there's an underscore in our uh, Twitter hashtag. Um, so feel free to engage with us in that way. Um, also, throughout the call today, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, enter them into the chat box. You can enter them privately to just me uh, to, to send it directly to the organizer only, or you can uh, have it be a public question to the entire audience. Um, I will do my best, uh, as well as I have a couple of my staff here that will make sure that I pay attention to those questions, and I will, I will certainly answer them as, uh, as I'm able to. So... Um, Let's continue on here. So who we are, English 3, We've got a nice little E3 here you can kind of see in this globe shape. We are a company, we've been around about 10 years now, coming up in 2016 will be our 10-year 10, 10 anniversary, which is exciting. Um, the, the the background of, of our company, really we started in the corporate education English training space. Uh, very specifically, we, we focused on uh, and continue to do so focus on on industry specific task based training for example we worked with uh, uh, companies like intel uh, where where they would need very specific training to help their employees in china be able to perform specific tasks as they uh, as they went around, went about their their job and so we would we would create uh, you know, very specific uh, modules where, where students could go through a module and when they come out the other end, they're able to very uh, proficiently perform that task. And so that's a lot of uh, where that's where we started. And then we've, we've worked with a lot of education uh, partners as well around the world in China, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, Guatemala, of course, in the U.S., Canada. Uh, so so we're, we're really all over the place and, and recently have have focused uh, quite a bit more of our efforts on the uh, U.S. education space and are doing some some fun things here. Um, the the purpose of this webinar is is not for me to sell you our products uh, or to dive into uh, exactly what we're doing there. I might briefly mention a thing or two, but but it really is to to accomplish these three things: is to number one, identify and understand some of these problems with international students and and see how we can potentially address those, determine the impact these problems have on your school, and discuss a few possible solutions. Again, uh, the, the majority of these solutions are not necessarily what we do, although we do have uh, many products that, that can certainly enhance the international, uh, the level of international student success at your school. So um, if you have additional questions about any products or anything that we have or do, um, again, please feel free to reach out to me at john.cheney at english3.com or info at english3.com. Either one of those will make it to me, and uh, and I'd be happy to uh, take time to, to do a one-on-one -on -one, um, discussion there. So with that being said, I think we're ready to jump right into this. So uh, the agenda, just a quick, uh, we, we just talked about the purpose, but um, we're going we're gonna to talk just a little bit about the problem here. And um, 
and then go over the survey results, which again will probably be the bulk of the webinar, and then solutions probably be the last five to ten minutes, and then Q&A. Um, and, and I say Q&A at the end, again, if you have something midway through where you want to clarify something or have a comment, please add it into the text box, and, and I'll, again, I'll do my best to continue to monitor that box and, and make sure that I address those questions at the appropriate time. So we'll, we'll dive right into the problem here. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I didn't talk a lot about my background. I, uh, I'm fluent in Chinese and Spanish, and have lived out of the country for uh, six years of my life. Uh, have have had a lot of opportunities to interface with international uh, students, with international companies, and just with international people just outside of the U.S. In general, I also uh, worked used to work for a company called Chegg. Um, more more specifically, the Zinch.com portion of that company that was acquired by Chegg, and, and worked with schools and helping them recruit international students. And did that for several years and learned a lot during that time. And often heard about many of these struggles and continued to uh, to educate myself in my in my current role here at English Three. So, um, referring to the left side of the screen here. Um, the, the first picture, referring to a survey, the ranking and reputation of a university was the single most important factor for international students when they were making their choice. This is from a recent article in the Pi News, and it, uh, you know, it was presenting the, the, the topic of the article was, hey, let's look at the top 100, top 200 schools for international students. Where, where are students deciding to go? And uh, the big story from this was there are 15 or 16 of the top 100 spots were lost by U.S. schools. They dropped into the into the into the top 200. Um, so they're still relevant, but but losing relevance. And that's um, that's not an exciting thing. Uh, there was a lot of growth in the U.K., a lot of growth in Australia, and and that continues to happen. But I believe students are uh, international. Well, international students are very smart, and I believe they're they're learning. Um, that there are lots of options out there, and these uh, uh, countries and and continents, I guess, if you take Australia around the world, are, um, are 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 really doing their best to impact, to positively impact that international student success piece. And and some schools in the U.S. are struggling with that a bit. Uh, so we're, that, that that's part of what we do here at English Three is we're we're trying to curb this. This is a a big message that that there is an issue here, and and we need to we need to do something about it. From the Wall Street Journal just a few months ago, when students arrive at college campuses from China, you see an incongruity between their performance and what their portfolio suggested they should be able to do. And a lot of our survey questions were around this piece. You know, are there are, are there per, perhaps better ways to measure uh, college readiness? Are there better ways to uh, to figure out whether or not a student is going to succeed or fail? And, and can we trust some of the existing uh, measurements that are that are out there right now. And then lastly, from inside higher ed, in, in my experience, most of these students arrive here with not enough English to succeed and scarcely enough to pass if they do at all. Uh, and, and this, uh, all three of these articles, you could, we could probably find another 10 articles in, in about 10 minutes for each topic here um, with, uh, and, and there's many more issues, but the point is um, international students uh, really do uh, struggle when they come here to the U.S. Uh, you know, again, I mentioned I'm fluent in a couple other languages. If I were to go to a college, I never, I never did go to college in in China or, or internationally. I went here in the U.S. But uh, but if I were to go over there, despite being fluent in Chinese, I know I would struggle. Uh, it's not easy to leave your home and and try to talk about advanced concepts in another language, uh, and and it really does require a lot of preparation and and, and many times a lot more preparation than international students seem to think. So um, we have a poll here. Um, what's the biggest challenge you face with your international students? And we had a multiple choice poll that was supposed to work somehow and GoToWebinar didn't do it. And we just checked the settings and it all looks like it's all set up right. But if you have any, if you want to answer this question, it's optional, of course. You can you can put it into the chat box and I can share some of those answers. Um, uh, what were what were our choices? We had English, culture, and classroom skills. So if you uh, if you want to pick from those top three and write any of those in there, feel free to, and I will uh, I'll make sure that I share those. Um, I'm going to continue on right now, but but I will I will definitely make sure I watch for for some of that. Plus, many of you did did answer questions similar to this in the survey, so we can jump right into that. 
um, to be to begin, you know, just to kind of set the stage a little bit with, you know, who did answer this? How many international students do you have at your school? Looks like the biggest chunk was kind of a, a, a mid range, 100 to 500 students. I know that's a, a, a large range there. Uh, a couple schools that just have a few students down here and, and actually a few schools that, uh, that that are very, very significant. You know, 4000 plus puts you in the top top schools in the in the country, if, if that's how many international students you have. Uh, again, there are places for all of these schools. Uh, the, the, there, there are some that are, you know, tiny community colleges and, and specialty schools and, and regional schools that aren't going to have as many, and that's fine on a percentage basis. They still might have, you know, 8% international students out of you know, 180 students. So um, I, I, one of the schools that, that we work with has just one international student and they have a total uh, student population of about 80, 85 students. And so um, that one international student gets a lot of attention and that's great. And then there's, again, the other opposite end of the spectrum where you're going to have uh, international students just overflowing. Um, what are the top three countries your international students come from? This is probably in line with if you've been to any other presentations this year in regards to international education or looked at the recent IIE reports. Uh, th these are going to be uh, right in right in line with those numbers and, and those uh, things. You know, China, 28 percent, India, 15 percent, South Korea, 15 percent. Um, this again, this is not necessarily the number of students that are coming from these countries, but the, for, from the respondents, how many of them mentioned these different countries? And then you've, you've got Brazil, Saudi Arabia, Japan, and Vietnam also with some, uh, with some mentions that, that kind of met that top seven or eight. So now we jump right into um, some of these uh, questions about, you know, desire to grow um, at, at your campus. You know, do you, do you want to increase your international student population? Most of you said yes. 18% uh, no, and, and I'm sure there are a variety of reasons for the no's, uh, which which I would love to love to understand more. Um, and, and it looks like we can see part of that reason might be. I don't know if these are the same 82, 83%, and 18, 17% here uh, people answering this question. It may be. And again, I we, we, we can't look at the results uh, very specifically, answer by answer, to see if the same people answered this, but. Um, potentially ESL services being available on campus affects whether or not you want to uh, have more students on campus. And, and that, that, that definitely makes sense. I visited with some schools recently that, that want to start ESL programs and, and they haven't really been, you know, they've kind of just been, they have 50, 60 international students and they want to grow to 150, 200 students, 300 students, but they just feel they can't do it without ESL services. On top of that, many international students, um, it's very attractive to them if there are ESL services available on campus so that if they are struggling, they can have support. Or if they don't speak English well enough to go in directly into campus, I'm sorry, yeah, right into class, they have to go through an ESL program first. They have that option available. So interesting that those two numbers were, were kind of right in line. So now we jump into what I what I think is uh, uh, the, the, the big telling piece of, uh, of this webinar today. Um, do you believe international students are adequately prepared for the American classroom on day one? A resounding no. A few people, yes, and, and that is excellent. Uh, that means that you have uh, that those 10% that you, you got to teach us, the, the rest of the, the, the schools here, how you're doing that. How are you vetting those students and how are you making sure that they are prepared? Um, and, and this is a very subjective question, of course, um, you know, what there's a lot of uh, ways to measure whether or not a student is really ready. Um, but again, 90 percent, pretty resounding no here. Um, so I'm going to spend a few minutes on this slide talking about some of these different issues. Um, please select all of the following problems that you have experience with international students at your school. One hundred percent of people. Uh, that responded to the survey. Uh, again, anytime you get 100% on anything, you know that something's something's there. Uh, language deficiencies. Uh, so students show up and they've passed the TOEFL or, or, or some, some sort of test, the IELTS, ITEP, Cambridge. There's a lot of tests out there. And regardless of the test, they're still struggling. Um, I want to I wanna just mention this. I, I, I don't believe this means that these tests are bad tests. I don't want to be sitting here and bash the TOEFL or bash any anything out there. Um, we have our own English proficiency test here at English 3, and, and, and we think it's a great test, but I still don't think it measures everything. Uh, it, it, it's very difficult, and that's because language isn't everything. And sometimes I believe problems that occur in the classroom 
might seem to be attributed to their English, but could very possibly be more related to that number three, unprepared for classroom culture at 71%, where they just don't understand how to interact. Um, again, back to my example of if I were to go over to China, I would, I, I know that I would be this, you know, crass, I think I'm all confident American, right? Where I'm sitting there and I'm going to just raise my hand and talk in class and, and, and say what I think. Um, and here in America, that might be okay. Uh, you might be able to deal with that in a classroom setting, but in China, that's, that's a no, no, right? You're not going to want to do that. Um, the, the, the teacher is going to say, why, why are you talking? I am the teacher here. Uh, take notes, sit quietly and tell me what I said when you, when you take the test. Um, and, and that's a, that's a generalization for sure, but, but it's absolutely, uh, true that the, the, that the culture is different. I, uh, I was sitting just a few days ago in, uh, in a meeting with with the school, one of our partners, um, and the the director of graduate admissions was um, he was sharing he was from New Zealand, and uh, you know probably thirty years ago he came over to the U.S. and and he said he was he just struggled big time. He said, yeah, you know I spoke English, but I just I was so uncomfortable coming over here from New Zealand and getting into this American culture that was very open, open discussions, lots of group work, lots of lots more involvement than I had ever had before uh, when I was, you know, in high school. And when he when he, you know, he got into that American classroom setting and was just uh, struggling a lot in that same meeting the, the current director of international admissions at that school said, yeah, you know, when we. Uh, uh, have our international student orientations. Uh, we have them a couple days after classes have started and, and, you know, kind of allow the students to ask some questions and, and, and get over some of these things. And one of the questions he likes to ask is how many of you were offended the first time somebody in your class raised their hand? And he says over 50% of people usually raise their hand in that, in that discussion. Um, over half, and, and it's basically any I, I've learned that it's basically any British based system, uh, along with many Asian cultures, uh, most of the world. I mean, at least half of the world, at least if you want to take those numbers right from his story, uh, it, it's different. It's, it's very, very different. And so um, some I, I know I've heard teachers say, hey, yeah, I've got this Chinese student that seems to be doing fairly well in class and on the on the tests. Uh, I'm sorry, seems to be doing fairly well on the tests. But in class doesn't participate. And, and, and I think it's because he just doesn't speak English well enough. Maybe that might be part of it, but I believe that a large part of that is because he doesn't know he can. And, and not only that he can, but that we want him to. If he's leading the class and doing well on the test, then he's obviously understanding it. And we want to hear what that person has to say. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back off language deficiencies for a minute. And continue on here. So plagiarism, uh, again, I think it's it's due to uh, a lack of education. And, you know, you sit down and, and tell somebody, OK, hey, uh, don't plagiarize. This is what plagiarism is. And here's APA, MLA, CMS, CIA, FBI, whatever, a bunch of things that they don't understand. Uh, you know, just a bunch of letters to them. And and, and maybe they've learned it. Maybe they haven't. And, and in some uh, international student orientations, I'm sure they do a good job at really diving into it. But most in my experience, just kind of breeze over it. And, uh, and they say, hey, if you plagiarize, you're going to be expelled or you're going to be suspended uh, or, or whatever the, or, or you're going to, you know, we're, we're going to sue you or something like, you know, there, there can be even uh, very, very uh, difficult uh, consequences to, to plagiarism. And we understand that in the U.S. very clearly, but other students uh, might have no idea what the word even means, uh, let alone how to actually do it. Um, and, and that requires just some training, I believe. Um, unprepared for classroom culture. We talked about this um, already with kind of in, in conjunction with the language deficiencies. Uh, again, my point was that I think that a lot of language deficiencies are incorrectly attributed. Well, culture problems are incorrectly attributed as language deficiencies, but there are still many other um, classroom culture pieces that that are very, uh, very difficult for students to to get used to. Unaware of American culture. Now, this is different from classroom culture. Um, and American culture can can certainly uh, cause some issues, different holidays that people might not understand uh, or uh, different customs. Uh, the way that people talk to each other, even walking in the hall uh, can be can be very different. 
Um, social problems. Uh, this one is is a major issue at, at many campuses, especially ones that, especially for those schools that answered in the, hey, I've, I have a thousand or I have four thousand students. You're going to have major demographics on your campus. Uh, you're going to have hundreds of different, you know, hundreds of Chinese students, hundreds of Indian students, hundreds of Saudi Arabian students. And, and when you have that big of a group, there's going to be, um, for lack of a better word, there's going to be clicks, right? There's people where people like to, to stick to themselves. Um, you know, as I was thinking about this the other day, um, I was reminded of the, the movie, I think it's called I robot with, uh, with Will Smith. That was, I, I think I only saw it once or twice, but, um, and, and came out in, I don't know, 15 years ago. I honestly have no idea um, when, when that was. But uh, but it, anyway, the, the, at the very end of the movie, it was about it was the, the whole movie was based around these robots that, that were very, very lifelike. Right. AI, uh, artificial intelligence and and really uh, approaching uh, human like qualities. And, and, and part of it was that they were kind of starting to evolve and, and become smarter and more more almost human like and at the very very end of the movie i remember a scene where will smith goes in and the whole movie's over but there was a, a kind of a shipyard or something with, with with shipping boxes those big huge uh containers and where where all the robots were being stored and he went and he peeked inside of one and all of the robots were huddled in a corner right next to each other even though there was tons of space in that big crate um they were all in just one little corner just all being together because that was a a, a human trait that people of, of a kind like to stick together and, 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 and just kind of move with one mind there. But uh, when you, when you get that times, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 or 70 different countries on your campus, uh, there's, there's going to be issues. Uh, obviously there are cultural differences that cause all kinds of issues, some more serious than others. Um, but but I believe there are many solutions that we'll talk about later that can that can help alleviate some of these social problems. Um, and I think that's part of the, the beauty of America as well. Uh, we're a we're a melting pot here and we welcome people from um, from all walks of life and and try to understand in the best way we can uh, what matters to them and, and why they why they tick. So I think I think it's a it's a huge uh, part of international education and part of why I, I personally love being involved. I love meeting people from other cultures. Uh, retention. Uh, international students, when they struggle with language deficiencies and plagiarism and classroom culture and American culture and social problems and the other 20 percent of problems that were down there that were uh, that were mentioned, uh, they're going to leave or they're going to drop out or they're going to get kicked out or it, it, it's going to be difficult for them. And uh, and and so uh, at least a third of people here mentioned that uh, that retention is an issue, and uh, and that can be either once they're already on campus, or maybe there's some perceived issue before they even show up, and and you know the, a summer melt type issue where the students just aren't even uh, you know they can't even make it past that stage because they don't think they're going to be successful. And I know there's other reasons, potentially financial and and other academic issues, but. But uh, but certainly when you're facing all of these issues, it's it's going to be easy to give up. So um, I will um, I'm going to do a quick check here on the on the chat box. I'm not seeing any uh, questions here, so that's fine. Um, all right. So we're going to keep going. So next, <clears throat> have you ever and this is probably the same 90 percent that answered the other way. Uh, the other question, have you ever had faculty or domestic students complain about problems with international students? Ninety percent. Yes. I've heard a lot of stories about this. Um, uh, in, in, you know, being in this, in this industry, there are, um, lots and lots of administrators out there who receive all sorts of flack. You know, they, they're, they're receiving kind of two messages, upper administration, the president says, Hey, we need more international students for a lot of reasons, right? They bring more revenue. They, uh, bring a, a they help us internationalize our campus. They expand our horizons there. You know, there's a lot of great reasons to bring international students in. And, and of course, uh, increased revenue is not, um, the only thing we're looking at, but uh, but schools do need money to to operate, and and international students are able to provide uh, provide some more of that. So inter so so presidents of a university might say, hey, we need more of this, or directors of admission say, hey, we we need more of this, and then they're forced sometimes to bring in students that might not be prepared, right, or that might not have had all the right mechanisms in place to ensure the success of international students. And sometimes I, I actually spoke with, uh, you know, one of the biggest, best schools here in the in the in the country or one of the largest in terms of international students and, and I guess uh, 
U.S. students is ASU, Arizona State. Uh, fantastic school, great international program, good friends with Mark Rentz, the, the executive director there. And he shared with me, um, I, I had dinner with him, oh, six months ago or so. And, and he said that, uh, you know, one of the things that happened with ASU is they grew way too fast. And uh, in, in some instances, they, they felt like, or they now feel like there's all these issues that they didn't really cover as they as they grew that now they're having to kind of play catch up on. And, and that's fine. You know, that means that their international recruitment folks did a great job. They did great marketing and they provide a great product. They have a great school there. Um, and uh, and now all of a sudden, all these issues that, you know, that we're talking about here are uh, are creeping up on them and, and, and causing some issues. And so they're they're actively developing really some great solutions over there as well. And and I, I communication with them quite often. Um, Due to international student problems at your school, has it ever been discussed to stop admitting international students? No. Now this is awesome. Despite the fact that 90% of you are saying that you're getting complaints all over the place, and 90% of you think that they're still not quite prepared, you're still willing to work with these students. And people, the, all the admissions counselors and everybody that works in those staff, um, I, I think this is excellent. 93% say, nope, we are going to do it anyway. We know we need it for a lot of reasons, but um, we're going to we're going to deal with the problems. And that's that's good. And, and but, but also at the same time can really uh, cause a problem. That means that you, you have all of these issues there and you don't want to stop admitting. So let's find solutions. Um, do you believe that standardized English proficiency tests are reliable indicators of college success? If not, please explain. Um, so we, we have two slides on this one with some of the reasons uh, for this, but 81% say that yeah, right now that they're, they're not really reliable indicators of college success. And again, back to what I said earlier, I don't think that these tests are bad. I think that they just, they only test one piece. Right now, for an international student to get into most schools, most higher ed schools in the U.S., uh, they have to get, you know, a good grade on the ACT or the SAT, and they also have to have a good GPA just like an American student. And then they have the additional requirement of, okay, you also have to be able to speak English and pass one of these tests. But that's not the whole story. You have all these other issues that were brought up um, that, that really cause issues. And, and even these tests, these tests are gamed um, left and right. When you have anything that's standardized, students figure out how to get past it. These international students are particularly good at getting past tests. Um, another quick story. There was a, a, a big, a, a big school, a top 100 school. I won't share the name just to, to keep, uh, keep it private, but uh, big school. I was speaking to their vice president of enrollment management um, again, probably about six months ago. Um, and he was receiving all kinds of complaints at his school. Um, from from staff members and and students and saying, hey, these international students are are not prepared and they're holding other people back, and and he's you know he got enough complaints that he finally said, all right, you know what, let's let's look into it. Let's let's do a let's do a statistical analysis here and see if we can find where the problems are, what really is happening, or or even if this is a problem. So he. Um, dove into, you know, he had his staff dive into all the numbers and say, all right, is there any statistical difference in the performance of international students as compared to domestic students? And they, they spent about four months gathering data, looking into a lot of this. And in the end, they came out with the, with the conclusion, nope, no difference at all. International students perform at the same rate, same level as domestic students. So, so what's the problem, right? Um, the problem was that the, the this uh, this survey, or I'm sorry, this analysis looked at the wrong thing. It looked at grades. It looked at how well these students are able to get past tests. They figure it out. It might be very, very painful for them and difficult and really hard for those teachers and students that are working with them to help them get there and TAs and lots of hard work um, that, that might not have needed to be as hard had there been other mechanisms in place. But the students still get the grades, but that's not what, what, what everything is about. It's not just about getting the grades. 
a good university, and I've seen many of them out there, and in fact, many of the people that are on this call right now represent these universities that are doing just incredible things, and that's why you're on this that's why you're on this webinar. That's why you're listening to this is because you do care about the real success of the students. And and the success is not just measured by the grades. It's measured by their experience and whether or not they would want to go back home and say, hey, when I was at so and so university, I felt like they cared about me. They cared about my success and they helped me and they gave me all the tools I needed to really be successful. Uh, those are the schools that are not dropping out of that top 100. Those are the schools that are moving up or holding their position. And, and, and by the way, there are many great schools still in that top 100 list if you go and look at it. But uh, but some schools have forgotten this a little bit. And, um, and, and so part of it is that this this process of just bringing international students in and relying on a single test that measures one aspect of what college students need of what international college students need to be successful uh, isn't cutting it so um, it's probably enough on this slide for now so here's uh, some of some of what you all are saying I've said enough here so uh, the test only test the test only test the student's English. There is much more that goes into college success. Uh, standardized tests are just one tool used to indicate future success. However, there are areas other than language which will contribute to a student's success or failure. Many students in Asian countries are good at memorizing words but not applying those words into practice. Excellent, excellent point here. Um, you know, just another quick tidbit. For those of you that have been over to China, you've seen the TOEFL prep centers. Those TOEFL prep centers are made with one purpose in mind, to make money. And they make their money based on how many students they can get past the TOEFL. They are not paid in any way, shape, or form for teaching students English. Students do have to learn English words and phrases and grammar concepts, and they have to be able to learn how to say a few things that they can then uh, use from their rote memorization in that test to pass it and sound like they actually might be ready. But unfortunately, just because of, of the nature of the beast, um, these students memorize, they get a 90 or a 98 on the TOEFL and they come over and all of a sudden they're put in real life scenarios that are very dynamic, fast paced, and way harder than what they faced as they were passing these tests and studying for these tests and they and they just drown in it. Um, they're, uh, they, they, again, they're good at memorizing, but not great. And, and it's simply because these TOEFL prep centers don't give the students many opportunities to practice English in a dynamic environment uh, at the level that they will really need to be able to do in college. Um, standardized anything is not a reliable measure of educational performance. I'm sure whoever wrote that uh, has, has some strong opinions about all standardized tests, and I'd love to figure out who that was and talk to them about it. Um, students study for the test not for college success and therefore can be unprepared for the classroom. Exactly in line with what, what these other people are saying. Some, some pass who are not ready, oftentimes in terms of language ability and also maturity, another issue there. Um, culture to culture, there's huge differences in maturity. I've, I've, been, I've, I've personally traveled to about 40 countries, I think, and, and it's amazing just the difference. Uh, an 18-year-old in one country versus another country can be very, very different, and it's just simply a cultural issue. Um, and they might be uh, more, more mature in some areas and, and less in others, and, and it's going to be different in every society. But, uh, but absolutely, that's another, another big piece that, uh, that happens. And you know, college is certainly a time where plenty of maturing can happen, uh, but but you would hope that there's at least a baseline level that they reach before they before they show up. I know that I could have used a lot of that when I went into college, so <laughs> I'm right in there with them. Uh, test prep programs teach to the test rather than focus on proficiency. Absolutely, what I was just saying in China. Good test takers are increasingly able to test well while having a lower proficiency level than expected given their scores. There are only one form of assessment and language proficiency is not an indicator of cognitive ability. Absolutely. And only part of the picture. So again, uh, it, it, again, none of these are really saying that, except for this standardized anything comment, most of them are saying, hey, you know what? It's great that we have a measurement of English, 
but we need more. We need more than just English. We need to be able to see if they can really function in an American classroom. And that's, that's what's, uh, that's what's happening here. That's what, that's what seems to be being said. Uh, again, another poll that unfortunately we, we would have a, normally have a button that pops up and it's all fancy and allows you to quit really quickly. But have you ever raised your TOEFL score in an attempt to enroll better qualified students? I have heard many, um, many stories about people who who said hey you know what the TOEFL just isn't high enough right because that's that's the the the, the mind frame of okay hey the TOEFL is what determines how successful an international student is right because that's the score that's the score we go off of um and or the IELTS and, and I'm not meaning I don't want to uh, single out the TOEFL here it's just the, the one of the common tests out there but I've heard people say okay hey we had a 72 and we raised it to a 78 and we raised it to an 84 and we raised it to a 91 and now it's a hundred, right? And we're still getting students that are struggling, um, and that can that can certainly cause some issues there. Um, so, do international students often fail during their first year due to lack of preparation? Surprising, surprisingly high on the yes. Um, Twenty-eight percent, due to all of those issues, just flat out fail. Um, most don't, which is great. Which again, I and again, I think this is another. Um, great thing here. Despite the fact that they do fail, um, ninety-seven percent of you are saying, or whatever that number was, are saying, "Hey, we're still going to keep accepting accepting these students, and we're going to keep trying, and we're going to keep getting better." Uh, so, uh, again, I would love to do whatever we can to to drop this green number down here to one percent or zero percent, if we can, uh, to help these students really uh, bridge that gap in a little smoother way. Um, okay, so we're gonna dive into this. There's a lot of comments here. We don't need to read them all. Um, we will be sending out this um, this presentation to all those who attend this webinar. So you will be able to kind of look at it if you wanna see some of the comments that people had. Again, they're all anonymous, so um, you can see what's going on here. But do you feel your international students currently have all necessary support services for success at your school? If not, what services would you add? Where would you look to find those services? And um, a lot of people are saying, hey, we need an English center. We need an ESL center, English writing and composition. Uh, we need a dedicated advisor. Um, no, we don't feel it's there, but we're working very hard to increase our services. We need one specifically for graduate international students. Um, we're having problems with housing concerns, and it would be great to have industry-specific, vocabulary-specific for each discipline. That's right in line with, with some of what we have done as a company. Um, uh, need career counseling, more preparatory intensive English, culture classes before before they actually show up is what they're saying here. Um, help prior to attending plagiarism, making appointments, professor office hours, language translation. So many things that, you know, I look at that and I think about an American student, right? They're not going to, it's not going to be difficult for them to figure out how to make an appointment or figure out how professor office hours work because we've grown up in a, in a, in a, you know, here in America, we, we're, we're used to it, right? It's, it's, it's not different. But, but even simple little things like this, international students need a lot of extra support and really a lot of handholding, especially during that first year, first semester, um, to and, and hopefully even before, right? You do everything you can to make sure that they just have it very clearly written out. A lot of times we just take it for granted. And, um, you know, any of, any of you who have ever traveled in, in Asia, uh, especially in countries where they don't have a lot of English. You know, if you go down in the middle of China or somewhere, it's difficult to get around and people just take it for granted that they can get around there, right? It's just, it's just, hey, I know how to get from A to B. And if an international person shows up, then great, but they're going to have to figure it out on their own. It can be very difficult, um, even just traveling around somewhere, let alone figuring out how to navigate a very complicated U.S. education system. Um, special tutors. Um, this this person says, hey, I feel like they're pretty good once they're on campus, but we really struggle um, figuring out which ones really are going to be ready, right? Um, majority of support is available, but students need more writing support, discipline specific. Uh, that's a couple times that people have said that. Um, this, this, this is an interesting one, I think. Uh, most international students are athletes, so they have a support network with coaches and teammates. That's that's awesome. Um, it, you know, they're saying here that the non-athletes need more support. Uh, I, I think that that goes right to the heart of the of the issue. Um, these students uh, know 
well, they need support. They need, they need to know that they're taken care of and that somebody cares about them. Uh, and on a soccer team or a, or a baseball team or a, a bowling team, whatever the, whatever they're doing, they have some sort of support network there, but most people are coming over as non-athletes. And so, um, I know that I'm, I'm sure every school that's on here has incredible international, an international support center, but do the students really know how to use it and take advantage of it and know and understand all the resources and really understand that, um, that students probably all over the campus are willing to help them. Um, they just need to learn how to approach that and, um, uh, and feel like they do have that support. Okay, how are we doing on time? We've got about 20 minutes left and we probably won't even use that full time. Um, how long is your international student orientation? Again, kind of more of a, more of a demographic question, but uh, most here, 41%, zero to one day. It's just, hey, come in, here's all your stuff, great. And, and there's a few people here that uh, have greater than seven days. Other, maybe that has some online uh, impl implications before they're actually showing up. Um, 15 percent, five to seven days, it's pretty solid, right? Um, my experience has, or at least from, from what I have heard out there, um, you, you, uh, the students really need a long time to get used to it. They can't change their mindset, especially when you talk about something as simple as raising your hand in class and learning how to do that naturally and learning how to work in groups with other students naturally. Um, it doesn't come in, in zero to one days, right? It doesn't come in a three hour session. And most of these sessions are, are very tactical in nature. They're saying, Hey, um, where's the, you know, what do you, what do you do if there's an emergency? Um, where's the writing support center? Um, how do you register for classes? Um, what, you know, what, what, what's covered with your health insurance? You know, it's very just, Hey, let's go over some of the details that are, again, very important to life, right? And they're all life things that are going to matter to them. And when that emergency does come up, they, you, you do want to make sure that international student knows exactly who to call and how to get a hold of them and, and at least knows to dial 911 for that emergency for their physical safety. Um, but most of them don't really have the uh, ability to really allow students to to change their mindset and really get into the mode of, okay, I'm an American college student now, or I'm at an American college campus and I need to understand what that means for me and how I need to act. So um, we're going to move on to the next one here. Um, what issues are covered in your international student orientation? So let's talk about some of those things I was just mentioning. International student services, plagiarism, campus safety, culture knowledge, classroom skills, other. Um, interesting to me that classroom skills is right at the bottom of this list, or they don't have one down here. Um, and yet when you go earlier in the survey, students or, or teachers say, hey, these students struggle the most with classroom skills. That's what they're complaining about, right? So it, it seems to me that classroom skills should potentially be much, much higher up on the list. And, and are there ways that you can allow students to really better learn those American classroom skills? So finally, um, that's the, the end of the result. And again, thank you to everybody who participated uh, in, in that survey. Uh, great, great answers. Um, really, really exciting to see. Um, it's, it's just great to look at data uh, in relation to, to what we do here at English 3 and, and, and very helpful. And I hope that it was beneficial to everybody that's sitting on here that, that, that it helps you understand where your school kind of fits in um, with everybody else. So a few solutions here. And again, I'm not going to dive into these terribly deep, but uh, pathway programs, and I, I, I'm defining a pathway program as anything that is designed to, that, that's in between um, when the student leaves their country to when they arrive or it, it kind of in that preparation. So it might be an ESL program. It might be uh, an online orientation program. It might be like our American classroom readiness course uh, where students can, uh, you know, practice things online uh, during an online course before they actually show up and, um, and, and really kind of get some of that orientation uh, ahead of time. It could be, um, just uh, a, a summer, or, I'm sorry, a, a semester. I, I've actually heard of some schools that bring international students in during the whole summer, like a full semester ahead of time to really allow them to get adjusted to everything before the real classes start in the fall. 
um, and they have maybe one or two courses uh, during that time to kind of just ease into it. I also uh, believe that um, community colleges are a fantastic pathway uh, to most universities. I, I, I in, in my previous role at, at Zinch, uh, oftentimes around, around that company, it was mentioned that international students probably should go to a community college first because uh, they're going to save a lot of money uh, and they're going to be in an in a easier school environment um, with with kind of more room for error and and they can kind of get out all the kinks and then dive into all right hey now I'm jumping into UCLA or now I'm jumping into Purdue or University of Washington and those those uh, pathway programs whether it's community college I, I think there should be something for everybody um, at least in a, to a certain degree, uh, individualized selection system. So this is, um, you, you know, th there are a lot of uh, companies out there that are trying to, uh, and and schools that are trying to create better selection systems, right? How can we, and and including including the very companies that, that I've mentioned on here a couple times, ETS with TOEFL and IELTS and Cambridge ITEP. All of these companies are constantly trying to improve their test, and they know they have deficiencies, and they're, they're constantly trying to make that better. And there are other third-party companies. Um, I, I know of one called Verikant that, that does video interviews to allow you to see students in China before they actually show up so you can see what they really look like. Um, we certainly have uh, products here with our uh, new English proficiency test that where you get to see uh, video responses of students in, in, a, in an English proficiency test format. Um, and, and of course, our American Classroom Readiness course does cover um, some of that as well because these students are actually recording videos of themselves throughout the entire process. And this could allow schools to make much better informed decisions um, as they can see students in, in real life scenarios. Um, better on-campus resources. And this can range from your International Student Services Office to uh, you know, on-campus activities that are intercultural and, and, that, and that hopefully bring everybody together and, and allow these students to uh, have, have social experiences that will, con that will kind of allow them to open up. Um, and, and feel more like they're at home. We are their home while they're away from home, and we need to make sure that we can uh, provide that. Uh, of course, housing uh, is going to be in here, and um, ESL support, and all the things that are on campus um, can be just fantastic solutions. Uh, again, today's webinar is not really supposed to be focused on solutions, but I did want to make sure we mentioned a few, and there, there are many, many more beyond these uh, that have been mentioned. Um, so, um, you know, finally, we're to the Q&A portion here. Um, there are a few questions that were submitted ahead of time, and so I will answer those quickly. Um, and, um, and if you have any other questions right now, please go ahead and, uh, and type them into the chat box. Again, you can send them privately or to the entire audience just by uh, down at the very bottom of your GoToWebinar control panel. There's a little chat box that you can, that you can open up. So uh, this first question, what data research can you share that shows students and institutions uh, you serve are satisfied with your product. Um, so this this is actually referring to our American Classroom Readiness course, I believe. Um, this is something that that could uh, hopefully help with that a little bit. Um, we we surveyed our, a lot of our students this year, and um, and and here's a few things that were said. Uh, you know, 100% of students said their language and culture skills improved. 100% of students would recommend this course to other international students. Again, whenever you get that 100% mark, you know you did something right. That's an A plus in school, and uh, and we're very excited that the students really, really loved it. Um, you can see some of what they said here, and I'm not going to read through all of these, but uh, but basically, you know, I'll read this one. I will recommend this to other international students because it helps them to acquire necessary English and American culture skills in addition to developing new friends and a bigger network. So um, this one helped them uh, gain confidence in their ability to speak in front of a large group of English speaking people. So these are people that were already accepted to a university. They had already passed the TOEFL at required level, but they felt like this course really got them ready to go. So again, that's a, a nice little uh, plug for our American Classroom Readiness course. Thanks for the question, whoever asked that. But uh, great activities in here. And you know, I, I don't have any, um, displayed here on screen any any uh, feedback from from teachers but one I'll just share one one little tidbit that we received uh, this from um, from one of our clients they said uh, that the teacher they had specific teachers come up um, and 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 tell them hey 
what what was different about this international student class? That these students are the best prepared students I've ever seen. And so um, we got that same uh, result from many of our partners this year. And so we're excited to, to see that. So um, have you ever compared uh, the success of international students who start at four-year universities to those who transfer from community colleges? Again, I was just talking about this a second ago. I We, we have not. This would be a great study. Um, and I'm sure at some point we will uh, we will dive into that a little bit. But, but yeah, again, I believe community colleges are a fantastic piece of the American education system. And I think there's great things that can happen there. Um, how many universities in the U.S. are currently English 3 customers? I think we're sitting at about 30 right now. And, uh, and, and then it, given the commitments that we have for next year, we're probably going to be hitting around 100 next year. Uh, again, we've, 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 we're a little bit new in, in this specific space. Um, but again, as I mentioned in the beginning, we've always been teaching industry specific. Um, and in this case, we just said, okay, hey, the industry is education. So we're going to focus specifically on, on, on education-specific English and culture skills to be able to, uh, to, be able to help these uh, students out. Um, we are interested in seeing how the learning module looks and works from a student's perspective. I would love to show you this. I'm not going to take time to do it on this call, but please send me a direct email and, uh, and we will uh, absolutely set that up and I'll get you in there and, and, and show you how the whole thing, whole thing works. Again, I think that's in reference to our American Classroom Readiness course. And then what updates are in the works? Uh, a, a lot. Um, it, you know, again, uh, we're, we're, we're constantly improving the technology. Um, we're adding more content that will uh, address plagiarism and academic integrity and, and getting even better at, at doing some of the classroom discussion pieces and group work pieces. And so we're, we're really helping these students uh, or wanting to help these students make the best transition possible. And, and we, receive, we received feedback from every single school that worked with us this year. And we are implementing almost everything that we receive so that we can continue uh, to be better. We do not purport to know everything. We know that people like you are the ones that are there on the ground. You see the real issues and we want to hear from you so that we can continue to improve everything that we do. Um, so that's it. Um, thank you again so much. Again, you can tweet if you want um, or, or share it however you would like um, with those hashtags. And uh, our, our, our my email address again is john.cheney at english3.com. Please uh, feel free to reach out to me. We will send this recording out to everybody along with the actual a, a PDF of the presentation so that you can have these results to share with other staff members at your university and, and your friends. And you can post it all over social media and LinkedIn and everything that you want to do there. So again, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to check one more time here. I don't see any questions that have been typed in. So we will um, call that um, a, a webinar. And, and again, thank you all for attending. Have a great day.